So my fiance and I have been on the lookout for a kitten to accompany our three-year-old kitten we have already. We searched and searched until one day he said to me, let's look on Craigslist. So I did. We found the perfect one, but the only problem was it was two and a half hours away from my home. I inquired about it around 10.30 p.m. I know it was late, but almost immediately I got a response. She sounded very nice over text and asked to see where I lived so she would feel more settled about the kitten living with us. She also insisted on going to their house. I know, I should have dropped it. At the time, I thought nothing of it, so I sent them a video. We set up time the next day to meet. Next day came. I wasn't going to take my fiance, but he insisted on coming with me because he wanted to protect me just in case, since Craigslist is sketchy. So we drove 2 hours and 30 minutes on our way there. As we were on our way, I was texting the girl, telling her that we would get there on time, and she responded with, Great, see you then. We arrived to the home, me in the driver's seat and my fiance in the passenger seat with the window down. I texted the girl and I got no response. I called, no response. I ended up calling five times and texting in the course of an hour and no response. I went up to the house and was knocking on the door, nothing. There was a car in the driveway but no response from the number or at the door. We got there around 6.30 and waited there until almost 8. Nothing. The neighbor came out asking what was wrong. I sent him there since I inquired about a kitten and she said, A kitten? Yes, it was an ad on Craigslist. She said, No one has kittens in this home though. I showed her the ad and she said, Oh, I know them. They are very sketchy people and they don't own any cats. I just helped them move their furniture yesterday. Well, the ad said that they had to get rid of their kittens since their new place doesn't allow pets. And the neighbor replied with, That's impossible. I have a dog and so does the next door over. I immediately found this creepy and I was feeling anxious. I thanked her and left along with my fiance. Literally immediately when we pulled out of the street, I got a text from the girl saying, I just got your messages. Something must be wrong with my phone. Did you still need a kitten or no? I didn't answer and we just headed back home. What I don't understand is, they didn't get any money from me, but they asked me to show up not knowing that I'd be with my fiance. I have a bad feeling about this. What did they want from me? I'm a female. When I was 19, I was looking for a room to rent in the city I was moving to for college. It was about an hour away from my family. I wasn't having much luck and my mom started helping me look for a place. She found an ad on Craigslist for a room to rent, which was in a house, everything included. The homeowner was a man and he rented the additional rooms to other women while he lived in the finished basement. The ad stated that he rarely ever saw the other roommates because he had a kitchen and his own entrance downstairs and that he preferred women because he's had issues with men roommates in the past, partying and causing damage. We decided to take a look since it was the cheapest that we could find in the area. My mom and I went to the house to view it. Decent home, decent neighborhood. He opened the door and was very welcoming. He was middle aged and the kitchen and living room were furnished nicely and clean. My mom likes to talk and get to know people, so they engaged in conversation while I stood there quietly and observed the place. He then said he would show me my room. We headed the staircase to go up, as I thought, since he said on the phone that my room would be upstairs with the other roommates. But he opens another door and we follow. He takes us down to the basement and opens the doorway to a very small room. No closet, no windows. He proceeds to say that this is my room and I would be sharing a bathroom in the hallway with him, and that his bathroom did not have a door on it. I was definitely thinking absolutely not, and that this is weird, but they were so deep in conversation that I couldn't interject. He then leads us upstairs and shows us the other rooms, which the doors were open, and says that they're currently rented. He starts telling us elaborate stories about the other women, not very nice stories, describing drinking problems. My mom was listening intently, 
but I took the time to investigate further. I looked in all three of the rooms and bedrooms. There was furniture, but not a single item in there looked like it belonged to a woman. No clothes or anything, only men's clothes in one of the closets. He had no problem with me creeping around the tenant's rooms without their permission. I then heard him tell my mom that he has some of his stuff in their closets, but they don't mind. And I'm just like, hmm, why the hell would a tenant pay for you to use their space as a storage? I was feeling really uncomfortable and started moving them back downstairs as they talked. My mom had mentioned when we arrived that her and my dad were going on vacation next week, but I couldn't because I had to work. He brought it up again and that I should come over next week and have dinner with him and the roomies. That way we could see if we all get along. I said sure and we left. As soon as we get in the car, I told my mom I would definitely not be moving there. She looked dumbfounded. I had to explain to her that not only did he lie about the room I would be in, and that I was not supposed to be in the basement with him, as well as her bathroom with him that didn't even have a damn door, but she also didn't notice that no one else lived there. She still didn't get it and thought I was just being paranoid. She legitly thought he was nice and it was a cheap deal. I had to explain it to my stepdad and had to get him to tell her that by no means would I be living there. I tried to report the post, but by the time we got home that day, he had removed it. I think he planned on murdering me at this dinner or abducting me and holding me hostage in that basement room with no way to escape. Edit. Some details have been coming back to me since I've been answering all of your questions. This happened in 2001, so it's been quite a while. When he took us upstairs, there was a wide landing that was surrounded by the rooms. He would start this long, intricate story about the women who lived there and talking about her alcoholism and a crazy ex. He was very exaggerated in how he talked with a lot of gestures. My mom stood there and listened to him. I don't know if it was sheer distraction or she didn't want to be rude by not listening. But either way, I don't recall her ever having a good look around those rooms. I went and looked. All the doors were open, had neatly made beds with dark wood frames, with a nightstand and a mirror. There were sliding mirror closets and they were empty, except for the one that had the male clothes hanging in it. Nothing was on the nightstand other than the lamp. I went into the bathrooms and there was nothing on the vanity or in the vanity other than some soap. I looked in the showers too, but nothing other than a bar of soap. The bedroom on the left had an empty suitcase laying open on the middle of the bed. This was one of the rooms with the empty closet. After seeing all this, I came back onto the landing and started slowly heading downstairs. They were still talking and absentmindedly followed me down to the living room. That's when he mentioned the dinner and we left shortly after. I think that's why my mom didn't notice a lot and didn't believe me at first. She didn't take more than a quick glance upstairs, and when we were in the basement, he was just as talkative. A commenter who works for law enforcement pointed out that this was probably a sex trafficking situation. The bedroom in the basement is where the victim is kept, drugged and abused until they're broken, and then trafficked. I honestly think this is more plausible with the situation, as well as the city is actually a hotspot for that. I am so grateful we got out of there and hope my experience can help someone one day notice the details and get out of a situation safely. Stay safe and bless people. There is this guy named David who inboxed me on Facebook one day and we started chatting throughout the week. He was being flirtatious with me at first, but I shut that down and let him know that he wasn't getting anything of that nature. Within the same week, he was asking to meet up once he found out that we stayed not too far from each other. And this became a consistent thing. I dodged the question every time he asked. Throughout texting for like six months, he told me about his life trauma and past relationships. And one day, he stopped getting on Facebook for a while. Then he popped back up, texting me from a different phone number, saying that he was in jail, but he never told me why. He told me that he was going to change his life around for his kids and stop being a bad boy. We texted throughout that month, like usual, but then kind of fell off as he went ghost on Facebook. 
I later found out that he was back in jail. One day, I decided to look up his mugshot and he had several charges going back to 2013, which included a couple of burglary charges and pretty much everything but murder. Be careful who you meet online, whether you're dating or it's just a friendship. A few years ago, I moved with my family right before I started college. Unfortunately, it was kind of far away from the university I had been accepted to, so I had been trying to find a place to rent that was closer to my university. My dad helped me and showed me an ad on Craigslist. There was a nice looking house for rent and it was close to my university. I decided to set up a meeting and go check out the place. I showed up in the afternoon and unfortunately I was alone. My dad said I was an adult and a big guy, so I shouldn't have to worry about meeting this person. This older guy greeted me and then goes, you have to follow me to the house that's for rent. I was confused and said, your dad said that this was the house for rent. Why do I have to go somewhere else? He replied with, this is my house. I'll take you to the one that's for rent. I'm a little concerned at this point and followed him to the other place. I figured if things didn't look right, I'll just leave. We get there and I noticed the house looks bad and it looked like there were people in it. I didn't see any other cars around, so this seemed odd. He looks at me and says, don't you want to go check it out? I said, I don't know, this isn't what was in your ad and it looks like other people are in there. He tells me that other people are checking it out and I could join them. Something just felt weird about the whole thing, and I told him I wasn't interested anymore. This place looked in bad shape from the outside, and appeared to have people in the house. When he asked why I wasn't interested, I told him that I was too far of a drive for school and work. He got mad at me, and accused me of wasting his time. I replied with, I'm not the one that's advertising the house, and then telling a person it's not the one for rent. He began to glance nervously towards the house and asked if I was sure I didn't want to check it out. I told him no one left. He never contacted me again, thankfully. I'm not sure what his intentions were, but something just felt wrong. Maybe he was just trying to show me the house, but I didn't like how he lied about the house to begin with and that there were people inside the house. I'm not sure what was going on there, but I didn't really want to find out. I also didn't like how he kept looking at the house when he was asking me if I was sure I didn't want to check it out. It seemed so bizarre how he went from being mad at me to getting kind of desperate for me to go inside. I have no idea where to post this, but I wanted to share what just happened. I tried FaceTiming with my best friend and someone answered it, but it wasn't my friend. I hadn't realized it wasn't her, so I stayed on the call as the camera was facing up the wall and ceiling. The person on the other end didn't say anything, so I began talking. That's when I noticed the purple wall. I had never seen a purple wall at her house. Suddenly the camera flipped and they hung up. I was freaked out because it wasn't something that my friend would do, since she doesn't answer calls unless she can stay on and talk with them. Confused, I text her asking if I called her, since I thought I could have called a wrong number. She said she didn't answer any call. Then I sent her a screenshot of my recent calls, and then when she checked, it did show that she answered a FaceTime at the same time. Moments later, I called her again through the message app, and she answered. I asked her if she painted her walls purple, but she had no idea what I was talking about. That's when I explained everything to her, and we all started freaking out. Update. Luckily, with the help of the comments, we figured out what happened. Once we checked the call information from her phone, it said that the FaceTime was answered by another device. She checked her Apple ID info and saw that another device was logged in that she didn't know. Quickly, she changed her password, and seconds later, she got a notification that someone in a different state was trying to log into her account. Still creepy to think that this person had access to everything in her iCloud information for who knows how long. I know my story won't be as interesting as some others here, 
but it's mine. And all these years later, it's still unexplainable to me and my brother. When we were about seven, we're twins. My brother and I like to sit in our shared room and do whatever it was seven-year-olds do after a school day. One night, we were both at the bottom of our bunks talking and taking turns playing my Game Boy. The door to our room is open and from the angle that we are laying at, you can see the living room and the kitchen of the apartment, which were connected. For some reason, both of us decided to turn our attention away from the game and look out the door at the same exact time. And we both saw what looked like a dark shadow in the shape of a man running across from the left side of the door to the right. The weird thing is, about a foot or two after our door, where the figure was running towards, was just a wall. I remember us thinking and talking about if the person was hiding just over the side of the door frame. We called our mother and told her the story and asked if someone else was here or it was just her. She obviously freaked out and said no. And when asked if she saw it too, as her room was right next to ours, she said she didn't. As we were already terrified of sleeping in the dark, all the lights in the house were on already, so there was no mistaking what we saw. We also didn't hear anything, we just saw it, which makes the experience even stranger. Nothing else supernatural happened in the apartment to us, and it's been about 12 years since that happened, and I still think about it from time to time. Honestly, if it weren't for my brother being right next to me and seeing it too, I might have written it off as a vivid dream. But I can remember the experience so clearly, and he does too. I honestly have no explanation for what we saw. I was staying up late watching TV one school night when I was around 16. I'm 23 now. I had to get up to go to the bathroom. When I was finished, I opened the door and walked out as normal. I had taken maybe two steps when I suddenly felt myself run into something and be slightly pushed back. Without thinking, I apologized as I believed it was one of my relatives. However, when I looked up, as I had my head down before, I realized that what I was looking at was an obscure, human-like shape that was entirely opaque. It was as if I had bumped directly into a shadow that had taken a three-dimensional form. Before the initial disbelief could even set in, it disappeared. I reached my hands out in front of me, but nothing was there. I literally sprinted back into my room and leaped on my bed. Nothing quite like that has happened to me since, but I definitely had other strange occurrences in this house. I'm wondering if any of the people had seen or heard of something similar and can help me find some literature on this description. Three weeks ago after my grandfather passed, I had my first sleepover. My friend and I went to sneak into the kitchen for a midnight snack. When we turned the corner, a black silhouette of a figure as tall as the ceiling was walking across the living room towards my parents' room. It was very, very muscular, a body like Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime, no hair, no clothes. I can only tell this by the definition of the edge of the silhouette. We froze. It turned to look back at us. It began walking towards us. It had one massive eye, like a cyclops. The two of us turned to slam the door behind us and hid under the covers on my bed, absolutely freaking out and sobbing. My whole life, I threw that in the vault, but today, sharing ghost stories with a friend, I finally talked about it in detail. They are floored and mind-blown, and I'm interested in hopefully finding out more about this experience. So a few years back, I had gone out with some of my friends to the mountains for a camping trip. And by camping, I mean getting drunk or high around a fire in the middle of the woods, and then pass out in our trucks. I was always the youngest of my friend group, and this took place before I found my taste of mind-altering substances. I'm typically something of a skeptic, and if this had happened nowadays, I would probably blame it on me being drunk, but I was stone cold sober the whole time, which is why I feel so sure of what I saw. We're all out by the campfire, maybe 10 or 15 of us, I'm sitting on someone's tailgate, smoking a cigarette when my friend, let's call him John, comes up to me clearly intoxicated. John was the one who I came out to the campsite with, and probably one of my closest friends of anyone out there. 
He asked me if I wanted to go on an adventure with him in the woods. I figured that if nothing else, I should probably go with him to make sure he doesn't directly fall over and hurt himself. Not to mention, even though I didn't drink or do any drugs back then, didn't mean I was opposed to fun adventures in the forest. So we walked past the tree line that surrounded the campfire and into the dense trees. The moon was out and it was pretty clear that night, so although it was dark, it wasn't pitch black. We come to a clearing that seemed to be made up by many flattish boulders and rocks. We were looking up at the night sky and John was drunk talking and I was listening and nodding with whatever nonsense he was saying. He sat down on one of the flatter rocks and eventually just laid down and passed out. I tried to jostle him awake, but he kept mumbling for me to let him rest for a while. Since this is usually how John behaves when he was drinking, I complied and figured that I'd head back to the campsite and check on him again in a little bit. I go back, talk to a few people, smoke a few cigarettes, and then decide to go back to check on John. Maybe 10 minutes had passed. I'm walking back to the clearing where I had left him, and already from afar, I noticed that he wasn't in the spot I had left him. I keep going, thinking he must have gotten up and wandered off somewhere. As I'm walking, I notice a shadow in shape of a human standing behind some shrubs a few feet to my right. I stopped, figuring that John was just messing with me. I said, Dude, come on. Let's head back to camp. No response. Then the stereotypical, Please, you're not scaring me. And still nothing. I move closer to the shadow and notice that I can't make out any distinguishable features, no shirt logos, no eyes, or any face for that matter. Just a vacuum of black that stood in the shape of a human, hanging out with me in the forest. I backed away, putting it all together that it wasn't John, and I ran back to camp. I checked the truck that John and I drove out, and there he is sleeping on the bench seat. I did a quick head count, and everyone that I recalled being there was still there. The only thing that convinces me that this was paranormal was the sheer absence of light that this thing took shape of. Just pure darkness. Whenever I tell the story, John always gets the chills imagining this thing was probably out there with him and around him when he was passed out by himself. The general conclusion was that John stumbled back a while after I left him and I didn't notice that he had returned. Like I said, I'm a skeptic so I always rationalize these things, but this is one of the experiences I've had that I just can't believe was simply my eyes playing tricks on me. I've heard of shadow people, but I always thought those were things that people just saw during sleep paralysis, not out in the wilderness fully awake. If anyone could give me any idea of what it could have been, that would be much appreciated. So from the ages of about 6 up until I was around 13, I was followed by what I believe was an evil spirit. Every night I would absolutely tremble at the thought that I had to go to bed. I lived in an old house, probably built in the early 1920s, with my grandmother and grandfather. Every night I would go to bed, only to wake up to what sounded like someone making yawning and snoring sounds in my room, and I would instantly open my eyes and see a grayish figure standing over my bed. Every night it would be there. I had bunk beds, but the bed beneath was taken out and a metal cupboard was placed there. It would constantly scratch the drawers all night long and walk around my room. I'd be absolutely terrified to move. I would stay in the same spot for up to 8 hours. My body would literally be in so much pain, but I wouldn't move an inch. I used to tell my grandmother about this, but she would assure me that it was only a nightmare and I would put it in the back of my head for the day and go to school knowing full well it was no dream and I would have to deal with it that night. My school life was terrible as I would only get about 1-3 to three hours of sleep a night. I was always so exhausted at school and used to have to stay back to catch up after all the kids had went home. Back at home, it started getting more intense and scary to the point I literally thought I was going to die. What went from walking around in my room, scratching drawers and making noises, turned to full blown sprinting down my stairs, running into our kitchen slamming every cupboard door running back up the stairs and bursting through my bedroom door and screaming. My grandmother and grandfather never woke up once from this. He used to knock my toys over and break things. 
It used to literally follow me to any house that I had a sleepover at. I remember one time I was at my aunt's house. It started slamming the cupboards, then burst in my room and stayed at the bottom of my bed all night, hissing like a snake. One time my wardrobe had moved throughout the night, basically blocking my door, only leaving a 10 inch gap. And as usual in the morning, I would get the blame. The worst night I ever experienced was when my granddad went to work early. I'd say around 4-ish. As soon as he left, I heard the slam of the cupboard doors. So I knew it was coming and I prepared myself by laying perfectly flat under the blanket, like I always do. It burst open my door, and I have goosebumps as I type this now. I felt it sinking in the footing of the bed. Something was on the bed and was slowly crawling up to me. I felt like screaming. I was 10 years old and terrified. It even terrifies me now thinking about it. It slowly crawled up my bed and started scratching the exact spot where my face was. I could almost feel what seemed to be claws slowly scratching at my face. I didn't know what to do, but I remember having the thought that maybe I'd wrap my arms around it and wrestle it in the blanket and dash off into my grandma's room to wake her up. But I was too terrified to move, and I really thought I was going to die. Thankfully, it climbed off my bed and ran up the stairs a few more times, and that was it for the night. As I got older, it started getting less and less until the last encounter, which was kind of weird. I was 13 and just started high school and hadn't experienced anything for months, possibly over a year at that point, but I still had terrible anxiety when going to sleep. I got ready for bed as usual and turned off my TV. There was a blue light on my TV which reflected onto the wall next to me. I heard a thud at the bottom of my bed and knew something was with me. I can clearly remember this as I was now in my teens. I was thinking to myself that I can't let this win this time. It already ruined my childhood. I can't let it win. I was looking at the blue reflection on my wall to see if I could see anything. I see this huge black shadow come over me, which stayed there for about five minutes and left. I say this was my weirdest experience because I felt no threat at the time. It didn't feel like anything wanted to hurt me, unlike the prior years. Could this have been a spirit looking over me? I don't know, but I do know that this was my last experience with whatever it was, and I'm 21 now. My grandparents still live in the house, but I moved out. If anyone could help me in any way, I'd appreciate it. I sometimes wonder what crawled up into the bed that night, and what would have happened if I tried to confront it. It's been years now, and I really want answers. Thank you for listening. I saw a shadow person. I was out parked on a backcountry road, and I was with two of my friends. It started out as a low dark blur. I thought it was a bush at first. It was through the windshield in plain view of all three of us. Then, it morphed into what looked like a crouching person with his head facing downward. Before our eyes, he slowly stood to full height head still pointed downward with his chin to his chest. Once he came to full height, his head rolled out to look directly at us, and then he disappeared. Naturally, both of my friends were freaking out. I was exhilarated because I'd never seen such clear evidence of the unknown before. I finally drove away at their insistence, but I know all three of us saw the same thing, and that it was fucking real. It had an air of malevolence to it that sent shivers down my spine, but I was on a high the whole rest of the night. Shadow people are real. So this happened a few years ago to my fiancé and I. While we were living at my mother's house for a little while, while we were in between places. It was nighttime during the summer. And we were out walking the dog and having a good time, as it had been oppressively hot earlier that day. Our dog was walking alone, enjoying his walkie time, and we were almost home. Suddenly, my fiancé stops dead still and presses her hand against my chest to stop me from moving forward. I say, what's up? And notice my dog has stopped still, staring intently at something in front of my mom's place. She had this porch light, which illuminated the lawn a little bit, and as my sight line went from my dog to the front yard, I saw 
Well, I don't know exactly. There was a humanoid figure on the front lawn that appeared to be dragging a large, contractor-style garbage bag toward the backyard, which abuts the woods and leads down to a creek. It's vague to recall it now, but it was tall, seemingly dressed darkly, maybe in jeans and a hoodie, but it was only partially visible in the porch light. When I looked up, its head moved toward us, and it felt like it was staring right at us. The three of us were paralyzed in that moment, all filled with dread, until my brain decided to kick in. Just turn around and keep walking. My fiance and I turned directly on our heels, and thank God, our dog did the same. Both of us refused to look behind us until we turned a corner much further down the street. Our dog was stealing looks behind us, watching our backs. Once we turned the corner, we called the police, who came around to meet us, and did a sweep of my mom's property, the surrounding properties, and the woods. There were six to eight cops total that responded, with the canine unit too. It's a rich area of the suburbs. Here's the kicker though, and why I think this story belongs here. The cops called us back later that night, we weren't sleeping anyway, to tell us they had turned up nothing. No footprints or evidence of anyone on the lawn. No drag marks from the bag. Their dogs caught no abnormal scents in the area. My fiance was livid at them because we definitely saw someone there. And from that point on, we walk our dog with knives and a walking stick at the ready, just in case. As time has gone on though, I've begun to wonder if it wasn't a person we saw, but a thing. How else could it leave no earthly trace of its existence? When my eyes were on it, all I felt was fear, filling my every thought, such that I was paralyzed. And I wasn't the only witness, since my fiancé and dog both saw it. And it was definitely dragging something along with it, which should have left a mark on the grass lawn. I've always been fascinated with stories of shadow people, wendigos, and skinwalkers, the latter two not being native to my area, allegedly. I do believe in ghosts, since we live in a house haunted by her deceased family. They didn't approve until I put a ring on it. Did we have a brush with the unknown that night? Or am I just failing to properly rationalize what we saw? Here goes. I can't find any information out about this entity. I'm trying to reach out to see if anyone else has come across her. A few nights ago, I had a dream. I was having a sleepover with a good friend. She was asleep under the blanket. I look at the end of the bed, and there is this long skinny shadow with long wild hair. She reaches out and grabs my ankles and pulls herself up and kind of wraps around me and hisses in my ear. I woke up, and she was crouching beside my side of the bed and reaching toward me. She was so tall, she reached the ceiling, even crouching. She was very thin, with long arms and long claw-like fingers, shadowy skin, long black wild hair, black eyes, and most importantly and disturbing, a grinning mouthful of long pointed teeth. I started punching and screaming. At first, she grinned wider and then disappeared. My partner woke up to me punching and screaming at my side of the bed. The next day, I texted my friend that was in this dream. We're both sensitive, but she feels and sees things stronger than I do and has a very level head. I also knew that she had seen a similar entity a few years ago in a different part of the city. I sent her a sketch and she confirmed it was the same entity that she had seen. She sent me a painting that she had done of it and it scared me so bad I could barely look at it. Normally she has an answer for things but this thing it scares the hell out of her too. To start off, I've always had a moderate belief in the paranormal and the unexplained. 
I am certain there exists a phenomena where we currently do not accept and understand, but at the same time, I don't just want to believe everything I hear from people. Skepticism for me has come along with maturity. Anyway, I'm a 22 year old male and I live in Portland, Oregon. All the accounts about to be described occurred in a two year window, starting about three years ago. Much of this happened at my old house where my mom, my brother and I lived. So in this house, there are three floors. Bottom floor is the garage in my brother's room. Middle floor is the kitchen and living room. And the top floor is my room, a bathroom and my mom's room. I would often spend many nights awake, tirelessly working on my music in my room while everyone else slept. Occasionally I would be alone in the middle of the night when I would feel a sense of uneasiness. I would feel as if I was being watched when I knew I wasn't. I felt like this on many occasions, but never thought anything of it, and it never really kept me up at night. Now, the first time I had some sort of clue that something was up was after I had left my house for a week or so. I went on a camping trip in southern Oregon with some friends. During the trip, we had ventured out into a rural town where we could make some calls and use Wi-Fi before heading back to the campsite. I remember my mom telling me that day over the phone that my aunt, let's just call her Anna, had come over to visit her this week, and that last night, she hadn't gotten any sleep. Anna had stayed in my room, and had slept on my bed, except for the fact that she hadn't really slept. She told my mom the next morning that the entire night, she had a fear of ever closing her eyes, because every time she did, she'd feel the presence of a large, dark man standing over the bed watching her. My mom told me that she refused to go back into that room, and asked my mom to remove me from there for my own safety. I refused and continued to sleep in my room because as far as I know, everything was normal and Anna may have just had a stressful day and was restless that night. So about a month passes and my cousin is over at the house. He's related to Anna. She is his aunt as well. We'll call him Cade. Cade is three years younger than me, so at the time, I was 19 and he was 16. We would always sleep in my room when he would come over, me in my bed, and him on a blow-up mattress on the floor, about a foot and a half away. So on the first night that he's over, we stay up really late, each of us on our phones. He was watching some car racing videos, and I was watching some deep web horror stories. I later found out that he was creeped out and scared by me watching those videos around him so late at night, but at the time I had no clue, so I kept watching. Eventually. We both fall asleep. In the middle of the night, he wakes up and turns over to go use the restroom when he sees something that makes him instantly nope that thought away. He said he saw a black figure standing between my bed and him and appeared to be looking down at me, laying on my bed. He pulled the covers over his head and didn't make a noise. Nothing else happened and he eventually fell asleep again. Now, about six months later, we had my mom's friend Ashton over at the house Ashton is a middle-aged man that my mom met through my father, and they had remained close friends ever since. He was sleeping in my room one night while I was over at my friend's house, and he couldn't sleep. He told us the next day that he kept on having extremely morbid dreams about people dying and killing each other constantly. He wouldn't explain much, but he said that he felt afraid to sleep because his dreams were essentially montages of violence. He left the house, and things returned to normal. Now keep in mind, up to this point, I never actually seen or felt this presence myself, aside from feeling watched on occasion, so I never really felt too afraid. Then, one day I get home from class, and my brother is freaked out. He is five years younger than me, and he is unlike me in the sense that he has little to no sense of humor. He doesn't joke around or make shit up. He's a very by the books, straight and narrow kind of kid. So I know for a fact that he doesn't make shit up for no reason. Well on this day he had been home alone while my mom was at work and I was at school. He had been laying down on the couch watching TV when all of a sudden out of the corner of his eye he saw something leaning around the wall to his left just slightly over the edge of the wall making its head visible. He turned to see what was there and there was nothing, nothing at all. Slightly disturbed, he raises the volume of the TV and tries to forget about it. 
he suddenly gets this feeling as if something quickly slid across the floor towards him, like a slug, but in a blink of an eye. I don't recall how exactly he felt this was its motion or what he saw to make him feel this, but I do know that he immediately hunched down onto the, the couch, crouching almost, out of being fear of being seen. He told me that this thing literally peers over the couch downwards at him, slowly creeping more and more into his vision. He jumps up and turns around and it's gone. Nothing is there. I asked him what it looked like from the few glimpses he had and all he could say that it was pitch black and only had one distinguishable feature, eyes. He doesn't recall the color but distinctly remembers seeing a pair of eyes each time he saw it. After this experience, however, he never saw it again. Now, this next thing was the first thing that happened to me, and to this day I can't explain it, and it's never quite occurred again. I had awoken up at 8 that morning, and went downstairs to make myself breakfast. I had laid down on the couch and closed my eyes for a few seconds, and before I knew it, I had almost dozed off. You know that stage right before you fall asleep where you're almost completely immersed but you can still hear all the sounds of the real world and think cognitively. Yeah, so that's where I was. Nearly asleep but not asleep yet. So I'm thinking to myself, what should I think about before I drift off when I suddenly get one of these black and white visuals? They appeared in an instant and I can remember constantly thinking, what the fuck? It was like I was looking through the eyes of some sort of other creature that perceives the world in black and white. The perspective I'm seeing is from the corner of my bedroom and is very near the floor, as if it's sitting. I almost want to open my eyes and say fuck sleep altogether, but my curiosity gets the best of me. I mentally suggest that this perspective look towards my mom's room. It elevates and walks out of my room, facing my mom's room. Now keep in mind, I'm seeing the perspective of whatever this is, almost as if I'm controlling it by thought. I then think to myself, okay, if I can make you turn away and start walking downstairs towards my sleeping body, I'm fucking done. Sure enough, after a singular thought, I see the view turn around and start walking downstairs. Now, I'm sleeping on the couch which is about 4 feet away from the bottom of the stairs. I really wanted to keep this thing walking down until I could bring it close to me and see myself from its perspective, but I remember feeling scared to draw it near me while I wasn't really there to defend myself. So instead, I say fuck this as it gets about 5 or 6 steps from the bottom. I open my eyes. I'm back in my real body now. And I immediately get up to search the stairs and later my room. But nothing. Now there has been several other interesting smaller experiences that I don't place too much weight on. Because it happened under the influence of drugs. For example, my best friend in college Danny and I were on acid one time. When he suddenly stops talking to me. He is staring behind me and I'm trying to figure out what's going on. When I start to feel the burning sensation on both of my forearms, like something is twisting and lightly burning them. He soon leaves the room altogether and comes back in maybe 20 minutes later. The rest of our trip we spend watching movies and it isn't until the next day he tells me what he saw. He was apparently speaking to me when all of a sudden he sees a large translucent but red tinted being standing behind me. It was at least 6 feet tall. I was currently sitting down as he notices this, and before his eyes, it reaches its two arms down, grabs hold of one of my arms with both of its hands, and this is exactly when I started reacting to the burning sensation on my arms, independent of him telling me what he was seeing. This thing, according to him, kept the grass on my arms and stood behind me until he left the room. He told me that he heard me talking to something and speaking deeply, like I was in a very involved conversation. When there is no one else in the room, and I also have no memory of this. Keep in mind, I had done acid around 4 or 5 times up to that point, and I never had things happen which I couldn't remember. Like I said, since this occurred on acid, I don't fully trust this experience as evidence of anything. The final piece, which makes this all the more interesting, is that my dad's longtime friend, who is sort of mystic, has heard about all these occurrences and she has an opinion of it which I think is most likely. See, I've almost died four times in my life. These were very close calls and to this day, I've survived them with no broken bones, no trips to the hospital. Those are stories for another day but my whole life I felt like I had a guardian angel or something looking over me. 
Couple that with the fact that everyone but me who spends any amount of time in my room somehow ends up seeing this black thing, except me, who literally sleeps and hangs out in that room every day, and you arrive at the conclusion that she did, this may be some sort of good being, a guardian for me, or at the very least, a benevolent character that is attached to me. I have never felt scared or threatened at any point by this thing, and it doesn't show itself to me, so my opinion is that it's either a defender or a bystander towards me. We have moved houses and I still think about this being often. I wish no ill will to it and don't even necessarily want it gone. The way I see it, as long as it can respectively coexist with me, I'm willing to stay bonded with it. I have no reason to fear it and I firmly believe if it wanted to, it could have hurt me or at very least scared me, and it never did, so that alone takes away any reason to fear it. Anyway, I'm interested in hearing what you guys have to say about this, and what you think about this. My father is the scariest man I've ever known, and when armed with a bottle of beer, he reaches nightmare levels. Just the crackle of his belt or the rise of his voice is enough to make me shake like a leaf. One night, when I struggled to get comfortable in bed from the bruises and sounds of my mom's crying, I hatched an ingenious idea to stop the pain and suffering. Scared dad. Clearly, he just didn't know how his actions made us feel, but if I scared him like he scared us, maybe he would change his ways. I tried anything I could think of to produce some fright and scare dad straight. I would hide and jump out at him, but he didn't even flinch. I placed a toy snake in his toilet, but that only resulted in a beating for me. Finally, I thought of destroying his alcohol. I know that people become scared when they lose something they love. So one by one, I poured my dad's bottles down the drain and eagerly awaited his reaction. I knew this would be it. This would be the thing to scare him. That night, I remember my father discovering the empty bottles and becoming angrier than I had ever seen him. I still remember him wrecking the house. I remember him storming into my room. I remember his hands around my neck and me seeing black. Luckily, my plan and hard work that night paid off though. Today, my father lives in a constant state of fear. I'm always watching him how timid and nervous he is all the time. Whenever I pay him a visit, his complexion turns pasty white, his body shivers like I used to, and he breaks out into a cold sweat. I scared my father so good, you would think that he saw a ghost. I couldn't believe it when I first discovered the online chats, my little girl talking with a random man on the internet. I felt my soul leave my body. I thought I raised her better, but in hindsight, I guess I should have been more observant. She's grown distant since the divorce, and maybe this is her way of receiving validation. I knew I had to do something drastic before this escalated and something despicable happened to my baby. I knew I couldn't confront her head on with this discovery. She's a teenager, and surely a confrontation would just lead her to keeping more secrets and dissolving trust over my snooping. I had a plan to scare her straight and show her the danger involved with talking to strangers online. I cut a deal with an employee at my company to create an account and contact my daughter on one of those online forums. Once they hit it off, he would pick her up and bring her to one of our warehouses. He would build up the suspense as a cliche, older creep, really put the fear of God in her. Then I would swoop in and point out how the consequences of her reckless actions could be deadly. The plan was executed to perfection, and after a few days my daughter agreed to meet up. She thought she was stealthy and snuck out at night to meet the stranger. I waited a few minutes and proceeded to make my way towards the warehouse. When I arrived, I saw my daughter exiting the building. She was pale as a ghost and wiping away tears. I had my grin as I got out of the car and approached her. Dad, she yelped as she ran towards me full speed. I'm sorry, I'm such an idiot. I can't believe I actually did something like this. Can you please not tell anyone about this? I felt a sense of beaming pride. My little girl had learned a valuable lesson and in this moment, our relationship felt restored. 
Baby girl, all I care about is your safety. Promise me you'll never do anything like this again, and we can pretend it never happened. She shot me a smile and nodded. I started to move towards the car when she stopped me. You're the best dad a girl could ask for, but we can't leave yet, daddy. You have to help me hide the body. A few nights ago, I was woken up by the sound of my father ordering someone to put their hands up. I'd left my window open that night to let the cool air in and I could hear him loud and clear. I hopped out of bed and was looking out my window. Someone had been in our barn and my dad caught them red handed. In fact, when I ran outside after grabbing a flashlight and my pistol, both of the man's hands were red, his face too, fresh blood, but none of it his. What the hell are you guys doing in there? My father said, aiming his shotgun right at the man's face. No, not man. Boy. He looked like he had barely hit puberty. The boy's eyes started welling up. I, I, please don't fucking shoot me. Jesus Christ. My parents have money. I'm sure they'll pay you and you could forget all about this. God, I'm so sorry. Please. My dad looked back and we shared a knowing glance. So you're from that prep school. Okay. You would rather not feel what a face of birdshot feels like. I hear you. What were you just doing in my goddamn barn? Oh my god, I'm fucking sorry. The boy fell to his knees. It was a hazing thing, I swear. My dad told me that I had to join the secret club in school, and they said I needed to prove myself. By doing what? I asked. Something bad, he admitted. They told me to kill something. I swear it was quick. I just used the blood to make it look bad, so they would let me in. Who'd you kill? My dad asked, taking a step towards the boy, for emphasis. One of your horses. I promise I'll pay you for it. I'm good for it, really. I didn't know whether I bought it until I saw the boy had pissed his pants. Dad, this is way over our heads. Secret clubs for rich psychos? I think we should just take the money before he shits himself too. He looks back, considering it for a moment. Fine. Double what the horse is worth. Pain and suffering and all that. Deal. The boy left his student ID behind his collateral and promised to return the next evening with the money. He never showed. The next night, though, we found him in the barn again. His throat was slit, a deep cut nearly halfway around his neck. The knife was left next to the body, now surrounded by the blood that drained out of him. The boy was all tied up zip ties keeping his hands behind his back and his ankles together. He would have been helpless when they stuck the needle through his lips over and over again, sewing them shut. I didn't need the note they stapled to his chest to understand. The message was loud and clear before I even read the paper. Forget about us. After spending yet another day at home with nothing to do, I went to bed early. The uneasy rest was interrupted by a shattering of glass. The electronic awareness of fear pulled me out of bed before I was even sure of what I heard. I ran softly to my bedroom door, making sure it was still locked, and I pressed my ear against it. From the direction of the living room, I heard crunching of glass. Someone had broken one of my windows and now was walking on the shards. Someone was in my house. I returned to my bed, trying in vain to stop myself from panicking. I immediately began to call 911, holding up the phone with one hand, while the other one searched my nightstand for something to defend myself with. I picked up my lamp, nearly dropping it as the cord tensed, and used my foot to pull the plug from the wall. The automated system warned me that there was a high volume of calls, and asked me to stay on the line if there was an emergency. I wondered, for the first time, what the home invader's intentions were. Did they want to hurt me? Were they out to steal my valuables? Did they want to raid my toilet paper supply? Nothing was off the table. People have been crazy lately. I stayed away from the door, putting safety above curiosity that told me to try hearing what they were up to again. After a minute of terrified silence, the emergency operator finally took my call. I whispered the details to them including my name and address, and they told me that help was on the way before hanging up. After I set the phone down, I heard the handle of my bedroom door jiggle. Open the door. A man's gruff voice called out. We know you're in there. I called the police assholes. 
I yelled back, so you better get the fuck out of here. The man laughed lightly. Careful, he said simply. I don't want to make a mess, but if you force my hand, open the door. Fuck you, I yelled back. I waited for an answer and got nothing. The piercing silence rang in my ears and I wondered if he had actually given up that easily. Then, almost without a sound, the handle began jiggling again. After a few clicks and scrapes, the door unlocked and slowly began to open. I watched in horror as it swung into the room, revealing nothing but the shadow beyond the new open doorway. From the darkness, I heard the gruff voice simply say, You're not Anthony. Who, my neighbor? After more silence, the voice responded, This is 4059, right? 4061, I corrected, holding my lamp tightly. The voice chuckled softly. My bad, wrong place. I'll be on my way. And after a moment of silence, he said, And hey, stay inside, alright? It's not safe out there. I received an email this morning that immediately caught my eye. Watch at your earliest convenience, it said. The email had a video attachment named after Owen, my son. I started the video, which showed two teenagers in a dimly lit classroom. Behind the teacher's desk was a taller boy obscured by darkness, and on the other side sat Owen. They were both in the uniform of the Catholic boarding school Owen had been sent to last year a school I'd attended in my teenage years. I had fond memories of the place. The rules were strict, but there was a lot of trouble to get into if you had the right peers. The boy behind the desk began to speak. Owen, consider this an interview. If I like what I hear, you will become the newest member of the Sinners Club, effective immediately. Yes, President, Owen said. Brushing sweat from his forehead. What is your greatest sin? The president said simply, almost innocently. Owen scratched his chin. That's a tough one. Do you mean more violent or impactful? The president laughed. I'd love to hear both. Let's start with the violence. Owen sat up in his chair, excited. When I was a kid... I found a puppy on my way home from school, threw away the collar and tags and told my parents it was a stray. My dad said we had to get rid of it, so I did. How? The president leaned forward, and I could see a smile forming on his shadowy face. Took it to a field by my house, stomped it until it stopped moving, didn't even bury it. Owen was grinning madly at the memory of it. The president leaned back, almost disappointed. The impact story, then. One of my teachers in middle school was getting too comfortable a few years back. Started acting like he was my boss. I got rid of him, too. The president leaned forward again. Okay. How? Owen giggled to himself. Bribed a girl from my class. Got her to accuse him of sleeping with her. The president grunted in approval. And he lost his job? Worse, Owen said, eyes shining. Fired, divorced, suicide. All in a calendar year. Cliché, but effective, the president noted, crossing his arms. So, Owen asked, am I in? I'll be honest, Owen. You're entertaining, but your sins are childish. Your dark spirit is relatively youthful compared to ours, but perhaps it will mature, even curdle with time. Welcome to the Sinners Club. I paused the video as they shook hands. As I expected, Owen had the potential to succeed, but not the maturity to truly impress his new peers. Concerning, yes, but certainly not surprising. He was always more brutish than clever. When I was president at Owen's age, I wouldn't have accepted him. But perhaps this boy saw something in him. However, however, 
it was just as likely that he only got in based on legacy preference. If so, he won't last long. My daughter was the rebellious type, but never one to run away. Sure, she had her constant squabbles with her mother and I that all teens are prone to, but she had no money or car. I know she didn't just up and leave. I know this was something worse. Within days, search dogs led authorities to a deep wooded area where police found a ripped bloody shirt. DNA testing showed it belonged to our daughter. My wife and I immediately told officers about the boyfriend. Our daughter was only 17 but she was hanging around a 20-year-old loser. Her grades had tanked, her relationship with the family dissolved, and her behavior became intolerable. He was a terrible influence. He was the root of all the family's problems. Surely he had something to do with this. A search warrant was executed and a bloody knife was discovered in his car. He was placed under arrest and my wife and I finally thought we could get some sleep at night. That sense of calm was disrupted when we received a phone call in the middle of the night. Police had found my daughter. She was still alive. She had survived a slash to the neck and several self-defense stab wounds to the hands and arms. She had ripped up her shirt to bandage the wounds and stumbled through the wilderness before being discovered by a search party. She was taken to the hospital and we were told to drive over right away. My wife and I jumped out of bed and rushed to the hospital at record speed. When we arrived, the nurses left the room and gave us some alone time with our daughter. We walked towards her timidly and waited for her to speak. She looked at us with a smile and said, You should have cut deeper. I can't wait until we're all back home. I had a pretty lonely childhood. No siblings, no mom. It was just me and my dad. But I always had the best birthdays. Every single birthday after my mom left was the best day ever. Why? One reason. Everyone celebrated it. Somehow, every person I crossed paths with knew my name and offered me presents. Whatever was nearby. Anything they could get their hands on. It was like everyone was a close personal friend as soon as I got near them. It was like a superpower. The best part was that no one remembered it. As soon as I walked far enough away, they always got confused looking and realized that whatever they'd given me, usually their phone or wallet, was suddenly missing. However, this year was different and I think it's my fault. My birthday is September 6th. Last year, it was during my first week of college. After a day of everyone on campus treating me like a king, I got this ridiculous boost of confidence and completely reinvented myself. I made friends, finally got a girlfriend, and I was really, truly happy every day of the year. But I took it for granted. I let myself get greedy, which sounds ridiculous in hindsight. You'd think that a kid used to nothing would be a little more grateful, right? I had an affair over the summer. I didn't plan to, but... It happened, and I kept it secret. Worse, the girl I'd been with thought I was single, so when I dumped her right before heading back to school, she was devastated. I was pointlessly cruel and selfish, and now I'm paying for it. How? One reason. When I woke up last Friday, everyone I crossed paths with hated my guts. At first... People just glared when I was walking by, but then it got worse. They called me names like cheater and scumbag while I walked to my first class. A couple people spat at me. I tried to stay in the back of the classroom, hoping that no one would be close enough to be affected by this curse. But everyone just looked at me. Then they just started throwing anything they could. I'm talking backpacks, textbooks, laptops, everything that wasn't nailed down. And they weren't gifts. Nowhere was safe. There were too many people everywhere. I walked off campus and just kept going. People rolled down their windows and threw things at me while I walked down the street. I tried getting on a bus and the driver just laughed. Told me to fuck off and close the door. 
after a few hours, I found an abandoned building and camped out inside for the rest of the day, knowing that it would be all over after midnight. But it isn't over. Every time I leave this place, people keep attacking me. I have to run away so they'll snap out of it. I have been stuck here for three days now. What the hell do I do? A young boy from our town died recently, and I can't get it out of my mind. This isn't just a random face I glanced at the newspaper or saw on a local newscast. No, this is different. I've seen this boy before. He was in my sister's grade. He lived a few blocks away on the main street of the small town. I've definitely seen this boy before. I saw him occasionally while picking up my sister from school. I saw him at the local supermarket with his mom and at a skate park near my job. I saw him riding his bike tirelessly around our neighborhood for hours on end. I've seen this boy many times. I wish I would have saw him the night when I sped through the crosswalk. If I saw him then, maybe I could stop seeing him now. I used to hate being an only child, but then I met Jacob Spencer. The kid has six siblings, all much younger than him, who he had to take care of while his mother was working three jobs to keep them fed. He never had free time, never got a good night's rest, never seemed happy. That boy was just a ball of stress and fatigue every time I saw him at school. When I crossed paths with Jacob a few months back, he was walking home from the center of town. I was heading back to my place in the same direction, riding my bicycle down the street when I saw him rubbing his temples and cursing to himself. I cruised up to him and eased on my brakes. Hey Jake, long time no see. You alright? No Kenny, he snapped. I just got laid off and no one in this town is hiring. I don't have a car, so I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Hey, no worries pal, I told him. Listen. I had the same problem a while back, but I got a job a few miles out of town, at a gas station, on the highway. I have to bike there, but it's not that bad. I don't have a bike, Jacob said, dismissing my suggestion. You can borrow my old one if you like, I offered. The chain is a little loose, but the tires are fine. Jacob looked up at me, almost confused by my generosity. You do that? Of course, I promised. Here, my place is a couple minutes away. I'll let you ride it around, see if it works out for you. That afternoon, Jacob and I rode bikes all around town for a few hours. He was all smiles. After we returned to my place, Jacob took a moment to gather himself before telling me something that I'll never forget. I've never felt more free, Kenny. Not once, not ever. I have to pay you back for this. No need, man, I said. You keep that bike, make some good use of it. And I shit you not, he cried right in front of me. He told me how much it meant to him, how he promised his mom that he'd keep the family together on her deathbed. How running into me felt like a blessing because now he had the means to keep the promise. We parted as friends and I felt honored to have been a helping hand to someone in need. I heard about Jacob's death a few days later. Apparently, he was riding his new bike along the highway when he lost control of the bike while going downhill and weaved directly into a semi's path. Last I heard, the Spencer kids were all in foster care and keeping them together wasn't a priority for the state. Spencer made a promise to keep his family together. In a misguided act of kindness, I accidentally broke that promise for him. If you've ever passed through Ashwood, Oregon, chances are you haven't noticed it. Maybe you stopped by and bought a snack at our general store or used our restrooms before moving on to Salem or Eugene. Maybe you spent the night at a family's motel. You wouldn't remember it though. It's a highway town, a rest stop, nothing special. We notice you, but you don't notice us. Some days, everyone who passes by keeps going and no one stops. It's so common that it's not even worth mentioning. It happens all the time. But when last Wednesday came and no one even passed by, we sure as hell noticed. 
My father and a few others drove down the highway, checking to see if the road had been closed. Rumors swirled. Some thought that we had been caught between road work on both sides. Others assumed that we had been quarantined. None of our phones worked, and the radios were all static. So you could imagine that those were the more tame theories. When one of the patrollers got back that night, he said that he had gone as far as Millsburg. Between here and there, every other highway town seemed normal, but Millsburg was abandoned. Ran into someone who lives near Freeway Lakes on the way back, he told us. He'd gone all the way to Salem, not a soul in sight. My dad had gone south, planning to go as far as Eugene. He never came back. And just like that, two of Oregon's biggest cities were ghost towns. Over 300,000 people were unaccounted for, my dad included. One patroller said that the ranch he'd stopped by was completely abandoned, animals included. Other patrollers hadn't seen any wildlife along the roads either. Alien abduction or invasion became the prevailing theory. This weekend, a couple of patrollers didn't come back. No one's checking the roads anymore. Yesterday morning, we woke up to find the south side of town abandoned. No signs of struggle were found. They were just gone. My sister decided to take their chances and hit the road. They went north, leaving me behind when I admitted that I was too afraid of leaving. They didn't come back. This morning, I woke up to find everyone else gone. My neighbors, their pets, everyone. The sun's setting. Maybe it's setting on me tonight. Maybe everything. I've stopped looking out the windows. There's no one coming. But I stay behind my desk in the motel lobby in case someone does show up. And I ask myself why. Am I still a motel clerk if there's no one to check in? Am I a son anymore if my dad's gone for good? Am I still a brother if my sister never comes back? Who am I if I'm no one to anyone? And for how much longer? Don't aim between the eyes, princess, he said. I peered through the night scope at the shapes coming out of the woods. Their brain pan is short, like a bear's. If you hit them between the eyes, you'll just get part of his hair and piss it off. Aim for the nose. Months ago, something changed. Wendigos weren't hunting solo anymore. Instead, they were hunting in packs. They got my mom and my little brother within a few days of each other. That happened only three weeks ago. And I still dream about my mother screaming for help. I didn't dream about my brother. I just saw him everywhere. Blood in his hair, frightened tears running down his cheeks. The Wendigo surrounded my mother on three sides. The only way for her to run was towards the side of the house where there was no door. They backed her up and overcame her. My brother was just too far from the house. Two Wendigos knocked him down and ripped him apart. Following that, Dad and I lived in a metal bunker. During the daytime, it was safe to go out and collect wood and water or empty buckets of whatever. We had plenty of ammo and three rifles. At night, we would turn off the lantern and put out any lit candles. Then we would sit by the gun slits and watch for Wendigos. After I watched one night, he said I was ready to start shooting. I bounced the rifle in the gun slit and watched through my scope. More Wendigos were slinking out of the woods. The radio dad left in the house had their attention, but one of the Wendigos lifted his snout to smell. He could smell my scent rafting out of the bunker. I had his nose in the crosshairs. The blast knocked me down. I sprung up to see a crumpled body and Wendigos looking at the body, then at the bunker. Dad got the next one. My next shot only staggered me for a moment. Dad shot again. Wendigos can move fast, but two shooters alternating shooting and loading can bring down an easy dozen. We killed every member of that pack. In the morning, we got the small tractor out of the barn and stacked the dead bodies. We burned them, the pillar of smoke rising like a smoke signal to any other Wendigo pack. Come here, 
die here. That was my last summer with dad. I was 14 years old. I learned how to shoot, how to drive, how to stack them and burn them. I show no mercy because when I was 14 years old, Wendigos followed my dad to town and tore him to pieces. Daylight didn't save him. Nightfall won't save them. Nothing will save them. I can cry and drive, bringing extinction with me. The cold was, well, it was insane. Best word for it, really. It was crazy how fast it snapped, how quickly the whole world found itself at 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and then 20 degrees, zero degrees. That's when people started dying. The most unprepared were the first to go. Obviously, children near the borders of the Sahara, old women living near the South America equator, any person who hadn't known that it could be this cold. I guess it was once it hit negative 50 that people really started to freak, really freak, stabbing each other over gas cans, huddling inside for months at a time, eating whatever they had, eating parts of themselves, eating each other. That was when the first reports of cannibalism started. Slowly, at first, but increasing with alarming speed as the world continued to descend. Negative 60, negative 80, negative 100. We started to even out around 140. I guess whatever had caused the impossible freeze thought that was enough. Humans started gathering in huddles, grouping, colonizing. We scrounged our food from what we could find, canned goods, rival gangs, and, of course, each other. It's crazy what hunger will do to a person. Some people pled the high road. No, I won't. I can't. That's wrong. You're disgusting. I can never even think to eat another person. But in the end, when you feel your belly against your spine, the high road doesn't seem so appetizing anymore. And I guess that's the price you pay. Living in a world like this is almost worse than dying. Human flesh kind of tastes like chicken. The worst thing I ever saw was a boy. He was missing like so many of us were, most of his fingers. Nothing but stumps and blackened palms. His ears were gone too, though he could hear us fine I think. He tried to cry, but his tears froze to his face. His skin peeled every time he opened his mouth. The water and ice caked his features, cracking and crackling and ripping his skin. And he begged us. He begged, almost on his knees. But his legs wouldn't bend. They were too stiff from the cold. His flesh was too rotten to eat, so we just burned him for warmth. The kid must have been 10 or 12. He had crawled for so long. He had almost smiled. Smiled with his blue and bleeding lips when he found us. He thought that we were his salvation. And we killed him. I can't even cry anymore because it freezes to my skin. I can't scream for the fear of ripping off my face. I can't hardly run because the cold freezes my legs. My bones ache. I can feel my lungs wheeze with every breath of freezing air. I can feel my heart start to slow. So the real question isn't what you'll do to survive because that answer is simple. Anything. The question is, why survive? Legends say the men go crazy on this here mountain. They say that when you go hungry enough, that the trees speak to you, whisper things in your ear. They whisper about your deepest, darkest desire. Their branches reach out to you like a mother to a crawling baby. They change you, strip you down, and I ain't just talking about clothes. They strip down your mind, they refine your feelings to the bare minimum. No remorse. No regret. No nothing. The trees turn to perfect killing machines. The cannibal Wendigo. If you look at a Wendigo before and after, you might think that they're completely different people. But don't listen to an old man's story. Just make sure you pack a good lunch before heading out. I get up from my table and grab my pack. Thanks. 
I'll be sure to keep my eyes peeled for any scary looking monsters. Davis gets up, grabbing his steak knife from the table. When did I say they look like monsters? Beware the skinwalker. That's what my parents told me. He roams the woods and steals up naughty children who stay out past bedtime. He'll shave your head and steal your face and wear you like a mask. It was a silly story told around the fires at night to scare young ones into obeying their parents. It worked. Every child returned home as soon as the golden blazing sun crest the highest mountain surrounding our tiny little city. As the last rays of light traveled across the land our ancestors claimed, sweeping like a wave, the children ran to the safety of their wooden homes. They all followed this rule up until they grew out of these silly superstitions. My old uncle Robin stayed out three nights hunting, they would boast. There's nothing out there to fear more than bears and mountain lions. They would stay out and party late into the night with other young ones against their parents' wishes. The parents couldn't get control of their children, so they started sending adults dressed in leather masks to scare the children back into their homes. It was him. I saw him with my own eyes. They would tell each other. He was there, wearing a face and everything. I'm lucky to be alive right now. But again, reasons brought them to the same conclusion. No children have gone missing in over a decade. How could the skinwalker have a face? They would hauntingly say, This is merely our parents trying to stop us from having our fun. Why should we let them? They again partied around large bonfires in the woods until late into the night. The parents, dismayed that their tricks have failed, lamented on and let it continue. There was no main issue with the partying. The children still got up to do their chores and tended their farms, if a little cranky. That is, until they began to disappear, one by one. Each night, one would disappear from the bonfires without the others noticing. The children, assuming it was their parents pulling tricks again, continued to party. After five disappearances, word got around town that there was a curfew set. During the day, men would go to search the woods and mothers would sit on the soft and comfy chairs imported from foreign lands and lay their grief down on the ground as they'd rip and tear at their hair. Their cries would be heard all the way into the forest where I was camping in my little cave. Their crying was annoying. Their children were alive, if a little less of what they used to be. I proudly sat and looked at my newest creation the face before me was perfectly intact. I had botched the other two and ripped the sides, ruining the faces, but this one was perfect. That was until I noticed the crinkles in the cheeks. There was suddenly a long and inhumanly deep laugh from farther into the cave. I jumped up and snatched my knife from the bloody cloth and whipped my face to the unknown entity in the cave. Shambling out came an eight-legged monster dripping with moisture from the dank insides of the cave. It was wrapped in hide after hide of what looked like leather. Upon closer inspections, they were perfect faces. They all looked as if they were freshly ripped off their victims' faces. A cold shiver went down my spine. This was more than what I was. I was a murderer who wanted more from their kills. This was something else. Something much more evil and ancient. This was a skinwalker. A little advice from an experienced predator. It drawled into a deep gravelly voice. Use the oil you cook with them to help ease the wrinkles in the face. I long for the nights where my mother would don an evening gown, punctuate every sentence of her lecture with the clicks and the clacks of her high heels as she strutted to the door and left a deep red imprint of her lips on my forehead before she allowed herself to be whisked away by her suitor of the night. Those nights were rare when your single mother works 12 hour shifts at a local nursing facility and comes back home to a long evening of drinking, loud television, and heated arguments with her children. 
This night was better than all the others because the universe had aligned the plans of everyone in our household to collide, leaving me behind for at least five hours worth of quiet alone time, something I rarely got. I was in my bedroom, my secret stash of snacks scattered all over my bed, and the one shared laptop we had in the house all to myself. I didn't know what I wanted to do first. Watch a movie? Sing along to karaoke songs on YouTube? Have a one woman dance party? I settled upon watching a scary movie and turned off all the lights to set the mood. I was barely past the 30 minute mark when I heard a distant sound of snickering. For a few seconds, I convinced myself that it was just background noise in the movie that I was watching, but my reassurance faltered when I paused the film and still heard it. I was frozen in place. I didn't know what to do. I just waited for something to happen, but nothing did. I slowly shifted my position. The bed frame creaked under my weight as I did so. I planted both feet on the ground and paused for a few minutes. It was most likely one of my siblings who had came back early and was playing a prank on me, or it could have been one of the neighborhood kids. Whoever it was, I was a 16 year old girl who wasn't taking any chances. I finally had the mind to scan the room for anything that I could use to defend myself. I shared my room with 6 and 8 year old girls. The entire place was childproof and my best bet was a heavy sports trophy, but I figured that it was better than nothing. The snickering got louder and nearer. It turned into chuckles. I didn't know whether I wanted to wait in here until I was found or to do the finding myself. I took another long, hard look at the trophy in my hands and decided to wait. With each minute that had passed, the laughter increased in volume and enthusiasm. It sounded like a child who knew his parents were heading towards his hiding spot during a game of hide and seek, laughing with the voice of an adult. Then I heard what sounded like chairs being dragged across the hardwood floor. It didn't sound like it was with much purpose other than to clear them out of the way. A slippery, slobbery wet noise followed Sue. It sounded familiar, yet it wasn't one that I had particularly heard before. Whoever was in the kitchen was slamming, ripping apart and mushing whatever it had in its hands. I heard squishes and squeals, and I could only assume it was some sick psychopath with a fetish of breaking into houses and mutilating large animals. Whatever it was, he was laughing throughout. I was terrified. There was this stranger in my kitchen laughing manically as he seemingly prepared himself a snack on the counter. There was an intruder in the downstairs of my house, the place where I had left my cell phone. I turned around to look at my laptop, wondering if the police would be able to respond to emails. I decided to give it a try anyways and tiptoed back to my bed. My trembling fingers struggled to type slowly and quietly, but I eventually managed to send an email and post for help on social media. An excruciating seven minutes passed until I heard someone pull up in the driveway. It didn't sound like the police though. I heard the sounds of heavy footsteps running up the front door, frantically jamming a key into the keyhole and swinging the door open. The laughter stopped for a brief second before it turned back into a roaring guffaw. A shriek and an ear piercing scream penetrated the silence of the neighborhood and whoever produced it turned around and ran towards the street taking their screams with them. The manic laughter followed Sue and I finally dared to run to my bedroom window. I saw my sister running down the street while screaming, trying to attract as much attention as she could. By the looks of it, she was succeeding. Running in the opposite direction was a naked man covered in a massive amount of blood that I had only seen before on television. He was still roaring with laughter as he disappeared out of sight. I watched out the window as a posse gathered just outside my house. My sister hadn't stopped screaming. I realized that she wasn't trying to attract attention, but she was actually hysterical. And I did not want to go downstairs to greet whatever had brought my sister to such a state. The crowd grew larger as flashing red and blue lights arrived and the footsteps stormed into my house. I heard curses and wretches downstairs before someone finally called out. All I could manage to produce at first was a squeak. A female police officer appeared in my doorway and asked me if I was alright. She told me to follow her with my eyes closed. 
Great advice for a rebellious teenager. I noticed her grasp become tighter when we reached the bottom of the stairs, and I couldn't help treating myself to a peek. Through squinted eyes, I saw dismembered body parts of my mother neatly arranged beside her decapitated head on the kitchen counter. I passed out. 47 minutes. That's how long I spent listening to my mother being torn into, ripped apart, mutilated, and eaten. The person responsible for that ran straight to his nursing facility, straight to his bedroom, and straight into bed. He laughed as they restrained him to his bed. He laughed as he was taken away in cuffs. He laughed as he was locked up in a cell. He laughed as he made eye contact with me in the courtroom as his sentence was being announced. I wouldn't be surprised if he was still laughing when I strapped him to the chair. He will never laugh again, nor will my mother. It all started a few months ago, around her birthday. Claire came home from work and was smelling like Axe body spray. At first, I brushed it off. Not my wife. She loves me. We have been faithful to each other for years. But then the doubt started to creep in. I've had to start working late shifts, weekends too, since we have been behind on our mortgage. My time at home has been literally less than 5 or 6 hours a day, and most of that time was spent asleep. But she rarely complained. In fact, most of the time she seemed happier when I left. Then one day I tried to kiss her on the neck and I saw a blemish there, as though someone else's lips had touched her skin. My first mistake was confronting her head on about it. Of course she denied. She yelled. She called me a bad guy. Typical cheater behavior. Worst of all, she got what she wanted insisted I start sleeping downstairs and saying that we needed separation, maybe even a divorce. All I got out of it was desperation and depression. She insisted that she was still faithful to me, but all the signs were there. I just didn't have any proof to back it up. What you need is a security system for your home. My buddy Chad said one night when I went to drink away my troubles. When did she realize what I got it for? I pointed out. So don't tell her. Wait until she's out of the house and make it discreet, you know, camera and the smoke alarm, shit like that. He said as he downed his whiskey. His half brain scheme didn't sound that bad and I knew that Claire had said she was going to spend the next few days at her mother's house to supposedly let things cool down between us. If I was going to get to the bottom of this, it was now or never. So that's what I did. As soon as I knew that she was gone, I contacted the local shop and had them come that afternoon. The technician didn't ask any questions, just put them exactly where I wanted them and threw in one of those doll cams as an extra bonus. I gave it to Claire as a peace offering, saying that I was sorry for the accusations. Sounds stupid I know. What are the chances she would even leave that doll around to let me listen in on her? But then I know my wife. She is sweet and kind and loving sure, but she is also very predictable. She put the stuffed doll exactly where I thought she would. I let a few more days pass, keeping things amicable between us as I went to and from work. Then the next time I was off, when she again insisted that she didn't want to spend any time with me alone, I went to check the cameras. Finally, I could get the answers I was looking for. The grainy tape started up about 13 minutes past 7 the previous night. That was about a half hour after I left for work. I saw my wife sitting there on the bed, wearing nothing but a sheer robe, staring at the ceiling. At first, I puzzled over what she might be doing. She was perfectly still, her back turned against the camera. As she took off her robe, and what I saw looked like little marks on the edge of her shoulders, then I saw a man enter the picture, and knew I was right. She placed him on the bed, ready to mount him, and I almost wanted to turn and look away disgusted with what she was about to do. Then, to my amazement, I watched as those little bumps began to gently push her skin outward. At first, it wasn't noticeable, 
just a slow curling of her back. Then suddenly the movement quickened and large pieces of bone broke out on either side. They made a cracking noise as I heard my wife scream out. I don't know if it was a sound of pleasure or pain. The bones pushed to the side and started to form sinew and stretch the skin to its limits. I realized that they were forming what appeared to be wings. Her lean form bent over towards the man that she had been seducing for that night, and I watched in abject horror as her mouth widened to reveal rows of sharp teeth, more than even a shark might have. Her lover's screams were now the ones that filled the void of the room. Blood splattered on the clean sheets, muscles and skin ripped apart like wrapping paper. Her fingers gnawing into his open chest cavity like claws as she ripped out his beating heart and then began to chew it like a piece of jerky. Her wings spread wide as she lifted her meal from the bed, moving him to the floor right in front of the camera to finish him off. I don't know how long she continued to eat. I couldn't bear to watch any longer. Then I looked towards the room in confusion, trying to understand how it's possible for the video to correlate with my pristine room. I never knew her to be a good cleaner, and surely there had to be some evidence of the body she had likely disposed of time and time again. Then I heard noises behind me. I turned to see her standing there. She saw me looking at the footage, and I'm certain that if I could see my face, it was probably paler than a ghost. Without a word, Claire crossed the room and looked down at the doll, playing with the strings like a cat plays with the ball of yarn. Then she crushed it slowly in her hand. It took less than a few seconds for her to reduce it to rubble. Moving to the bed, she crossed her legs and smiled at me, the same way she had when we first started dating. So, what happens now? She asked. I found myself at a loss for words. Then I finally went over towards her and smiled nervously, remembering the other cameras in the house, remembering that she didn't know what I had seen or if I had saved anything. I get everything in the divorce or I will leak what I have all over the internet to every priest, demon hunter, and damn X-File junkie there is. Are we clear? I said with the best poker face I could muster. I knew she could kill me in a heartbeat, but I also know that if that was her goal, she would have done that years ago. She needed me, for what I don't know, but all she did was nod and kiss me slowly. It was fun while it lasted, wasn't it? She asked as she got up from the bed. I never saw her again after that night, and I hope I never do. Oh, and one more thing, I don't think I'm ever going to uninstall these cameras. I'm an adrenaline junkie. I suppose that's a good way to start this. My thoughts are a bit jumbled, so you have to bear with me. Chasing the high is how I spent all my time. I'd skip out on bills if it meant I could afford going to one of those few escape rooms in the country I hadn't been to yet. That was my biggest hobby for a time. Skydiving and other daredevil activities had stopped working a long time ago. They were always the same thing. If you've done it once, you've done it a million times. Escape rooms though, they had new puzzles to figure out each time. I guess it was only a matter of time before I'd grow out of those as well. At the age of 23, I discovered urban exploration. In my mind, this was basically the same thing as escape rooms, except there aren't any actors. The dangers of being caught and fined only fueled the fire in me more. I made it my mission to find and document spirits. Of course, this was better in my head than it did in execution. Try and try I might, but I couldn't find anything worth sharing with the world. Name almost any haunted place in the United States. I've been there, found nothing, and went home with doubts. Sure, I had some stories. One time I fell into an open elevator shaft and caught a rusty wire to save myself. It sounds cooler on paper, I promise. 
Another time, I heard footsteps and voices on the floor above me in an abandoned asylum. I ran up and was met with another group. Disappointment isn't a strong enough word. Until recently, the scariest encounter I had ever had was stumbling upon a deranged homeless man who chased me out of an old-fashioned farmhouse with a knife. That one revived my interest for a time, at least until I realized the odds of something like that happening again were slim to none. If you couldn't already tell, I had a bit of a problem. Some would call me insane. For this reason, I had no friends, and my family avoided me like the plague. That was okay. I understood. My lifestyle is a lot to keep up with, so I stay busy either way. Well, I guess I did have one friend, even though I had never met him in person. We got to know each other through an urban exploration forum. If you thought I was obsessed, this guy brought it to a whole nother level. His name was Derek. After a few interactions, we gave each other our real life phone numbers and kept each other updated on our findings. This guy had the lowdown on everything. He knew places Google didn't know about. I lost countless jobs due to my lifestyle. It was tough finding an employer who wouldn't get mad at me for leaving days at a time with no warning. How I made it work for as long as I did is just as much of a mystery as it probably is to you. Call it good luck in the getting hired department or something. If I lost a job, I could find another one pretty quick. Of course, this meant I never worked anywhere for a long time. But hey, if I ever caught something worthwhile on camera, I could set myself up for a while. As you can assume, this started seeming more and more like a fairy tale day by day. My belief in the paranormal had dwindled to near absolute zero. I went a while wondering what was next for me. Doubt that I would find the next high was creeping more and more into my subconscious every day. I was now 25. I had spent two years wasting my life and had nothing to show for it. Just a sketchy job history and an empty bank account. It's not like I could do much with all the footage either. What was I going to do? incriminate myself by publishing videos of me breaking into almost every place of interest in the United States. Surprisingly, I began to accept my fate. It was finally time to nut up and fix my life. For weeks, I had tried reconnecting with my family and got back to speaking terms with most of them. My old friends gave me the silent treatment, but honestly, I don't blame them. Life was going okay for a time. That was until I got a text from Derek. It read, Hey Tom, I got intel on an abandoned asylum in Montana. I know those are your favorite. Going to check it out in a week. Supposed to be the real deal. Many missing person cases in the area. I'll send you coordinates so if you don't hear from me, you know where to look. You know me though, I always carry. Attached was the image with coordinates. I'd be lying if I said his text didn't pique my interest, especially considering I lived in northern Idaho and this place wasn't that far away. I traveled all across the country before. This would be nothing. But my life was starting to move forward. I couldn't let this stop that. Plus, I knew that Derek would update me if he found anything. Even if there wasn't, he'd text me something like, it was a bust, or something along those lines. Fast forward two weeks. I'm ashamed to say that I spent every day for the last week waiting for an update. It was getting to me, so I text Derek. Hey Derek, find anything in Montana? It wasn't like him to not update me right away. As I said, he is really into this stuff and it was like he couldn't wait to tell me everything once he returned home. I wouldn't have been surprised if I got a response within a few minutes. Fast forward another two weeks and no response ever came. This left me in a moral dilemma. What if something happened to Derek? What if he needed my help? The adrenaline-fueled habits returned to my mind, and I'm sure you can guess what happened next. This story wouldn't exist if I didn't do exactly what you expect. I had no info on the asylum other than the location, but that would have to do. I began my drive around noon, I'll spare you the nonsense of my driving excursion, considering I was held up a number of times by different annoyances. I arrived at 10 p.m. It was completely dark, just the way I like it. Arriving, it was a one-way in, one-way out road. 
that was roughly five miles, if I had to guess. The place was eerie, to say the least. This place was decrepit. The windows were still intact, surprisingly, and it was six stories. This asylum was massive. Pulling into the giant gravel parking lot, there were no other cars in sight. Okay, so maybe nothing happened to Derek. His car would still be here, if he was, right? There's always an off chance that he could hide his car, but considering the desolation of the surroundings, there would be no point. I grabbed my camera and began to walk. Reaching the steps, I felt a chill. How I missed that feeling. It's always worth checking if the front door is accessible. A lock can be told whether or not the front doors are locked or unlocked. If they were unlocked, it could be a hot spot for locals. If not, it could be moderately patrolled. The giant double door swung wide open without a budge. I was instantly hit with the smell of rot. It wasn't just normal rot. Trust me. Over the past couple years, I've smelled it all. This was putrid, like iron mixed with literal shit. Naturally, it was dark, but my military-grade flashlight lit the place up like it was daylight. My handheld cannon also had night vision, so seeing was no issue. In the main room, there was a front desk and three hallways, one leading straight and one to either side of me. Odd. Usually, there would be stairs here. But judging by the outside of this building, it could be older than any other that I had explored yet. I couldn't wait to see what I would find. Figuring that the doors were placed in the dead center, I decided to flip a coin. Heads, I'd go right. Tails, I'd go left. I fished a quarter out of my pocket and flipped it. Missing the catch, the quarter bounced off the ground. The sound echoed down all three hallways. It seemed to never end. Once the sound reached what seemed to be forever away, the sound started to echo back towards me. I'm no expert, but this didn't seem right. I was then smacked square in the forehead by something. It stung like hell. I heard the quarter hit the ground again. What the hell? Did that quarter just come flying down the hallway and hit me? No way it could bounce with that velocity that I was hit with. Not that the former made sense either. Anybody with a logical brain would have left right then and there. But I was intrigued, not scared. Dreams of catching something and becoming famous began flooding my mind in the same way it used to. I shined a flashlight down on my feet to find the quarter. Yep, this place must be the real deal. The quarter was sitting on its side. I don't know the odds of that happening. I had never seen it before. I thought for a second, if it was to hit my forehead while facing forward and going forward was never an option, something really wanted me to go away. If I was to catch this something on film, that would be the way to go. So forward I went. I walked about a hundred yards when I came across the stairs leading up. The building was really bigger on the inside because there was still a lot of hallway to go. I ascended the stairs and reached the second floor. Looking back, I don't know how I didn't find it odd that the building was six stories, but the stairs only went up one floor. I was met with another hallway. Doors to individual rooms were littered both ways. Wheelchairs and other expected debris were littered everywhere. I decided to head right, the same direction I was heading on the first floor. I was curious how long this hallway really went. I pivoted to the right, and this is where things got real. Ten feet in front of me was a girl in a gown, long black hair covering her face. Holy shit, I caught something. I checked the camera and she showed up clear as day. Ma'am, do you need help? I asked. I was ecstatic. This was something no one has ever captured before. The clearest footage possible. This was bound to go viral. I took a couple steps forward towards her. Leave, she whispered. I couldn't think of much to say, but I managed a quick, why? Leave while you still have the chance. You don't have much time, she said. What do you mean? I asked. This was unreal. Not only did I capture her spirit on film, but I was having a conversation with it. Derek wasn't kidding. I mumbled under my breath. Derek didn't listen either. She instantly whispered. Wait, 
What does she mean? Derek didn't listen? This was everything I hoped for, but if the spirits here are this bold, why did Derek never say anything? I bet he's at home thinking about how to publish his own footage right now. That asshole. He was going to become famous first. I can't believe he didn't tell me about this. Money does strange things to people. In retrospect, the magnitude of the situation hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm speaking to a spirit, face to face, and she has told me to leave. Here I am, filming like an idiot. Maybe I should go. I checked the camera again to make sure I was still capturing this. I was. I have what I need. Maybe I should just go. I took a step back and the woman let out a scream and ran into the room closest to her. Okay, yeah, I'm leaving. This is too much even for me. I turned around and before I could even react, I was cold clocked across the head. I hit the ground and the camera and flashlight flew off my head. I didn't try to retrieve them. I got back on my feet and took a few steps back. Standing in front of me was a man dressed as a surgeon. He was muscular, too muscular. This guy made Arnold look small. The look in his eyes was crazed, to say the least. In his hand was a giant knife. I turned around and continued down the hallway as fast as I could. I could hear him running, trailing behind me, but he seemed to be slower than me. I ran for what seemed like ages, till I came to a cafeteria. It is what you would imagine it to be, large and open. I'd be trapped if I stayed, but I couldn't turn around now. The surgeon was still stomping his way down the hallway. The kitchen was my only option. I hopped through the serving window and was impressed by the size of the kitchen. I chose to hide inside one of the ovens. There were five ovens in total and everything else was too wide open to risk. I climbed into the last one and held my breath the best I could. The surgeon entered maybe 30 seconds later. He was searching everything, pulling counters off the walls with brute strength and flipping them over. He got to the ovens and searched the first, then the second, third, fourth. He placed his hands on the door for mine and that's when I heard a noise in the cafeteria. He must have heard it too because he let out a guttural scream and released the oven to find the source. I just might be saved. I waited about five minutes before I finally climbed out. I don't know what the sound that spared my life in that moment was, but I wasn't going to stand around to question it. I creeped back to the haunting hallway and walked as lightly as I could to find the stairs. I was going to get out of here now. A long while in, I was met once again by this woman. You need to hurry. She told me. How much further do I have? I questioned. You're getting close to the stairs. Stay quiet and once you reach the first floor, run. Each floor has an evil entity haunting it. This floor is the safest. The entity on the first floor is not as dumb as this one. Stay safe. There's hundreds of us trapped here. Now go. I wanted to ask her why she was helping me, but she was gone once again. I eventually saw something shining in the distance. It was my flashlight. I could start running, grab my flashlight, grab my camera that had to be near, and get out of here. I began my jog, but just as I did, I heard that scream again. The silhouette of the surgeon was on the other side of the flashlight. He was closer to it than I. But remembering how slow he was, I might be able to outrun him. I knew what was behind me and I couldn't risk getting caught again with nowhere to hide. I sprinted faster than I ever have in my life. His pace quickened as well. For a time, it looked like I might beat him, but once I got closer, I realized the flashlight must have flown pretty far. He was going to beat me. I'm screwed. I'd have to risk juking him. There was no other option. I never felt this kind of adrenaline before. We met at the stairs at the same time and I went to dive down the steps, but it was useless. He caught me and slammed me to the ground. He was too powerful. He slammed a knife onto my chest 
and I felt a cold liquid cover my torso. Tom! Someone yelled. Next thing I knew, someone tackled the surgeon off of me. I scrambled to my feet and flew down the stairs, not questioning why they knew my name. I reached the first floor and began another mad dash to escape this hell. The floor was littered with blood. It was everywhere. I could hear hundreds of voices telling me to run. It was overbearing, but I did just that. I reached the door, went through them like they weren't even there, and flew down the steps. Then I hit an invisible wall. Looking out into the parking lot, there were cars everywhere, mine included. I suppose I got everything I hoped for. It wasn't worth it though, because in the end, it cost me my life.